Okay, so welcome to this lecture series on environment and ecology presented by Mentors for IS in association with Bangalore IS Academy and Nama KPSE. So in this video, we will be discussing about aquatic ecosystems. Okay, so an ecosystem is nothing but a community of organisms that live and interact within a particular environment. When it comes to an aquatic ecosystem, that environment is water and all these systems, plants and animals live either in or on that water. So the specific setting and type of water such as a fresh water lake or a salt water marsh actually determines which animals and plants actually live there. Now we have already classified aquatic ecosystems when discussing biomes but generally we always classify aquatic ecosystems on the basis of salinity. So on the basis of salinity we can classify the aquatic ecosystems into three types. One is freshwater ecosystem, two we have the marine ecosystem and finally we have the brackish water ecosystems. So the first type is the freshwater ecosystems. So the freshwater ecosystems, this is nothing but due to continuous cycling that it has low salinity or low salt content that is less than 5 parts per thousand. So whenever the salinity level is low, we refer it to as freshwater ecosystems that is the salt content is less than 5 parts per thousand. The freshwater ecosystems can be further classified into lotic ecosystems that is moving water such as rivers and streams as well as lentic ecosystems that is stagnant water such as lakes and ponds. The second type of freshwater sorry the second type of aquatic ecosystem is marine ecosystem. Now marine ecosystems are water bodies with very high salt concentration that is more than 35 parts per thousand. Obviously this is nothing but your oceans and seas. So this makes up for the marine ecosystems. The third type of aquatic ecosystem is the brackish water ecosystems. Now brackish water ecosystems have salt concentration between 5 to 35 parts per thousand. So whenever the salt concentration is anywhere 5 parts per thousand to 35 parts per thousand that is when we refer it to as a brackish water ecosystem. Therefore the salinity level of brackish water ecosystems is anywhere between that of freshwater ecosystems and marine water ecosystems. So your examples would be estuaries, mangroves and marshes. Okay, so I want you to know that see the salinity in water is nothing but due to the presence of salts. Now usually whatever water body that you take the most abundant type of salt that you have is always sodium chloride. You can always make a note of it NaCl. Sodium chloride is the most abundant type of salt which is actually present in water bodies. So if this is understood next let us move on to the aquatic organisms. So the aquatic organisms both flora and fauna are unevenly distributed in the aquatic ecosystem but can be classified into five major groups based on where they are found within this water body. So there are five types here we have mucin, periphyton, plankton, nectin and benthos. So we'll just briefly discuss each of these five types. Okay, the first is mucin. Now mucin refers to organisms which are found along the surface of water that is where the water and air meet of lakes, oceans or slow moving portions of streams. So when, so when you take a water body the organisms which are found along the surface they are referred to as mucin. So the first type over here is hyponeustin. Now hyponeustin includes species living just underneath the water surface. Take this image over here 
on the right hand side top over here. So this is nothing but mosquito larvae which is floating under the water's surface. So it is nothing but living just under the water surface. This is hyponeustin. The second is epineustin. Now species that are above but immersed in water. This represents epineustin. For example, your water lily or your lotus, for example. Now they are immersed under water. They are growing from the bottom up, but still they are along the surface. This represents epineustin. And finally, we have superneustin. Now, superneustin refers to organisms that are able to travel over the surface on hydrophobic structures. For example, you can take this particular insect over here, which is known as a water strider, which can more or less glide over the water surface by supporting its weight on water tension. So, this is known as Neustin. Sometimes Neustin can also be referred to as uh, Pleustin. Now what I want you to remember is that due to their nature, these type of organisms referred to as Newton, uh, sorry Neustin, they are found usually in stagnant water. So water should not be moving. So lakes, ponds, this is where you have these type of organisms. If there's a lot of turbulence like a river for example, these type of organisms will not be found over there. So this makes up for the first type of organism which is or aquatic organism. Second type is periphyton. Now periphyton refers to organisms such as algae, cyanobacteria and heterotrophic microbes that attach themselves to submerged surfaces in aquatic ecosystems. So they may be found on rocks, underwater plants or any other surface underwater. So you can see in this image over here. So this looks like moss on a rock surface. So these are nothing but periphyton. Now these are nothing but it could be algae which are actually growing on a surface under water. And it is not restricted only to water, sorry, uh, rock surfaces. They could also attach themselves on other organisms. It, they can also attach themselves on plants, underwater plants for example. Now, the importance of periphyton is that periphyton actually serves as an important food source for, inner, for invertebrates, tadpoles and the fish which live under water. Apart from that, I want you to remember this, periphyton can also absorb contaminants from water and hence acts as an indicator of water quality. Please remember, I'll just repeat this. It can absorb contaminants from water and can act as an indicator of water quality. Now, since it acts as an indicator of water quality, there are certain properties that you must know when it comes to periphyton as to why does it act as an indicator of water quality. Now, the reason it acts as an indicator is that one, it is known for its sensitivity to change and also its tolerance level. It is known for its sensitivity to change. Second, it has a very fast response to change. It has a fast response to change. And third, it is easy to sample. It is easy to sample. So this covers up periphyton. Uh, and in some areas, sorry, uh, in some what do you call as aquaculture, where aquaculture growth is carried out, Periphyton communities are also used as a filtering system in such aquacultures to remove solid and dissolved pollutants. So this makes up for periphyton. Third, we move on to plankton. Now, plankton refers to the diverse collection of organisms that live in large water bodies and are unable to swim against a current. The individual organisms constituting plankton are called plankters. So this includes bacteria, archaea, algae, protozoa and other drifting and floating animals that inhabit the pelagic zone of oceans. Now there are different zones in a water body, we, this will take it up later. Okay. So coming back to plankton, some plankton will drift this way for their entire life cycle whereas others are classified as plankton only when they are young. 
for example jellyfish for example what i'm trying to say is that some organisms when they are young they are so small that they are not able to navigate the water so they cannot navigate against the water's force so in whichever direction the water is moving they will also move along in the same direction however some of these organisms can grow up to become larger in size and they should be able to navigate pretty comfortably but generally plankton refers to all those microscopic organisms which are not able to navigate by themselves to a great extent that is free movement is restricted to a great extent depending upon the force of moving water so what we will do here is that we will broadly classify planktons into two types one is phytoplankton the other is zooplankton now phytoplankton represents plants whereas zooplankton represents animals okay so i'll just briefly discuss phytoplankton and zooplankton you can just uh, make a note of these things okay so these two pictures over here the top one uh, denotes phytoplankton whereas the one in the bottom represents zooplankton now phytoplankton are microscopic plants which play a huge role in the marine food web so like plants on land they have chlorophyll use nutrients from the surroundings and through photosynthesis use sun's energy to support themselves phytoplankton actually account for almost half of the photosynthesis on the planet making them one of the largest producers of oxygen on the planet since they need sun's energy for photosynthesis they are found very close to the water surface and not at greater depths please make a note of this point phytoplankton since they need sun's energy then since they depend on sunlight for photosynthesis they are more or less found very close to the surface but not on the surface like newton they are found very close to the surface where there is penetration of sunlight so this makes up for phytoplankton next moving on to zooplankton zooplankton includes microscopic animals like krill uh, sea snails or pelagic worms it also includes younger ones of larger in uh, of larger invertebrates and fish as well as weak swimmers like jellyfish so most zooplankton eat phytoplankton and in turn they are eaten by larger animals for example krill which i just mentioned is an example for zooplankton is a major component of the diet of whales so zooplankton feed on phytoplankton zooplankton in turn are fed upon by uh, other organisms higher up in the food chain say for example whales do feed on zooplankton so here what happens is that during daylight zooplankton generally drift in deeper waters to avoid predators but at night they these microscopic creatures venture to the surface to feed on phytoplankton this process is actually considered to be the largest migration on earth and also visible from space now planktons can actually be found in salt water and fresh water uh, one way to actually tell if a body of water has large plankton population is to look at its clarity very clear water means less plankton population okay now if this is understood let us slowly move on to the significance of plankton now plankton actually play a very very important role in aquatic ecosystems so based on whatever i have said i think it should be pretty clear that they have a significant role to play in the aquatic ecosystem the food web the carbon cycle as well as the oxygen cycle carbon cycle why because you have phytoplankton which through photosynthesis fix carbon oxygen cycle why because zooplankton and other organ uh, zooplankton takes in this oxygen and releases carbon dioxide zooplankton and phytoplankton form that basic level in a food web and in turn they help in maintaining the entire ecosystem so uh, planktons are incredibly important to the oceans ecosystem and they are also very sensitive to changes in their environment such as temperature salinity ph level and nutrient concentration of water for example when there are too many of certain nutrients in the water it results in harmful algal blooms algae blooms like something known as red tides 
something known as red tide. You should be able to see this red tide over here. This is nothing but uh, uh, what you call as an explosion in the reproduction of these algae, phytoplankton. So they are reproducing at a rapid rate due to favorable conditions that is nutrients because nutrients also act as a limiting factor over here. So this is nothing but known as a red tide. Also climate change is today affecting their timing and abundance which in turn is now affecting the population of zooplankton and hence the entire food chain. So human activities like temperature increase, uh, acidification of uh, uh, ocean waters, all these things are actually affecting the way phytoplankton are actually reproducing. Now if the life cycle of the phytoplankton is affected, this will affect the zooplankton. If zooplankton are affected, this will in turn affect the entire aquatic food web or food chain. Therefore, it is actually important to ensure that the population, that the reproduction rate of phytoplankton is actually viable in aquatic ecosystems. If not, the entire aquatic ecosystem itself may go haywire. So this completes our discussion on plankton. Next, we move on to nectin. First, we'll discuss nectin. Now, nectin refers to aquatic organisms which are active swimmers. So they are relatively large and powerful as they have to overcome water currents. So nectin includes your fish, shark, whales, reptiles, seals, crab, all that can easily navigate through water. And they are generally nothing but your heterotrophs in your aquatic ecosystem. However, you can just make a note of this as I've already mentioned. Some organisms may start their life as plankton, but as they grow, they will transition into nectin. So nectin represents all your fishes, all those big animals which are able to swim in water bodies. This is nothing but nectin. Next, we can move on to benthos. Now, the benthic organisms are those which are found in the bottom of the water bodies, that is the seabed, riverbed or lake bed. So in this image, you can see the bottom of the water body. So those organisms which are found along the bottom of the water bodies, they are referred to as benthos or benthic organisms. Now, since light is absorbed before it can reach the bottom of water bodies, the energy source for deep benthic ecosystems is often organic matter which higher up, which sinks from higher up in the water column. That, that is nothing but your, no, when dead and decaying matter from a higher level slowly drifts down to the depths. So this dead and decay matter actually forms a main food source and energy source for these benthic organisms which are found at the bottom of the water body. So the dead and decaying matter sustains the benthic food chain and is mostly made of scavengers and detritivores. So if the main source of food is nothing but dead and decaying matter, Obviously, your benthic organisms are mostly made up of scavengers and detritivores, but it is not restricted only to scavengers or detritivores. Say for example, you may have stingray, which is actually a fish. It may not only be a scavenger. You can also have aquatic plants which are found along the surface, but in shallow waters, but still at the bottom of the water body. They may all form a part of your benthic organisms or benthic sorry uh, life which is found along the bottom of the water body so this makes up for benthos so with this we actually cover or complete our introduction to aquatic ecosystems and also the different aquatic uh, organisms if you do have any doubt please do write to us in the comment section thank you